okay. Well, you know what? With all of that, we're going we're, we're gonna to start one more time. Are you ready? So we're going to do take two here. Welcome to the flight deck. Okay. We got Brendan Lane back there. Levi is up in Washington, D.C. this week. So Brendan's uh, popped in to do, do some music and to do the camera work out there. Um, so say hi to the people on the web that are watching this stuff now. And, um, but welcome here. We're excited. You're glad you're here. Oh, what? Yeah. You guys, it's fun because the intercession that we got going on here is really powerful. I was on the phone with somebody that some of us have been after. She was over in Paris at a conference there and then over Geneva. She's this international attorney who's an intercessor and so forth. And anyway, it just, it means so much because we connected and so I'd track her and get word out to you. The other uh, woman, some we've been praying for in Africa, Jill is back in States and she wants to come down here and meet y'all because of oh, yes. the ways that that's you've all covered. So there's, there's ways in which you're reaching and connecting and doing stuff in a lot of places and so that's cool to see. Hey, um, I'm very pleased to have Mike Wells here. Um, and I, uh, and uh, Mike, I wanted to show you this picture because this is where Mike is from, Montana. Now, you see that little island? That's called Wild Goose Island. So this seemed like a very appropriate. But the real reason I want to show this to you because this is who Mike is. This, this brings his heart for kingdom and his vision, okay? And I wanted him to be here because we get together regularly and he's got a huge heart for kingdom. And I really, I, and you've heard me say this, I really didn't care what he taught on. I wanted him in the room. Because I've learned this, that if Jesus just stood here and didn't say a word, would it imprint on you? Yes. Okay, it would definitely. And the same is true. It's why you've got to watch where you go. It's not just what they say. It's more the character imprints, right? And I, I want you to pick up the flavor of Holy Spirit in Mike. Because he's very candid. He's very frank. He's got a great, it is a new model called Northbridge Church. I'd encourage you all to check it out online. There may be some place there that you're supposed to connect with, right? We're always talking to you about alignment. We don't want you here any longer than you're supposed to be. We want you to go and plug in where you're supposed to be on assignment. A lot of you are double dippers. You go somewhere else and you come here too, you know? That's okay. I just sent a video out to encourage a brand new plant out in Sacramento and they saw the carrier model. That's what they fashioned on. They wanted a welcome video from us. And it was like, and I was welcoming all the double dippers on a little videotape thing. So it's great. And so cross-pollinate, okay? And Mike was kind enough to let me go up there. That's a Jim Shadrick word. And, and there you go. Mike, Mike had the courage and the audacity to actually invite me up and, and let me, you, you know, you prayed for it, for the, to lead a Seder up there. And it was really cool. And uh, it just the timing worked out for Mike to come here. And uh, I, I just trust him. Okay? And I trust him with you. So um, I'm encouraged. And Sarah, his wife is here, who's the one who has to try and hold everything together when Mike is being Montana, you know, because sometimes those big picture people can, can be a little bit. So um, we're just grateful. So Mike, come on up. We're going to mic you up. Uh, I, I did not try to be funny that. But right now, I just want, let, let's just, just put your hands to pray for him. Lord, we just call up this word now for Mike. We acknowledge the authority and the anointing and the call for kingdom that you've set on him. We just make a demand now on that anointing. <laughs> we say, bring it on, God. Bring it on. Bring it strong. Bring it long, whatever you got to do. Just, just bring it. And Lord, we just speak peace and freedom to Mike. To have complete freedom in this house, to follow you wherever it goes, and we just say to him, have at it. Amen. Okay. All right. Well, it was uh, doing our first, or it was actually the second time we did a Seder at Northbridge, and uh Stephen took it to a whole new level, and um, which that is part of his gift. But um, I really didn't grasp the 
um, amount of change that what Stephen would impart to us would um, bring. And it was great because he stretched us. A little closer. All right, there we go. Um, he stretched us and he, uh, he taught us all and we're still bearing the fruit of that. But one of the funniest things that happened is I delegated the meal list. And anyone knows that if you don't inspect what you expect, you're going to get something different. <laughs> so for that meal that was supposed to be unleavened bread, we had rolls with our dinner. And uh, it was, I walked out there and we saw it and I was like, Stephen, is it really that bad if we had leaven rolls? Because they're here. And uh, we, we just got quite a laugh out of that. And that's just kind of, okay, Lord, we're just in this. Let us learn. And um, it, it was quite an, an enjoyable evening. And four hours into that, we had a great time. <laughs> yeah, we had originally had chicken cordon bleu, and there's like, there's ham in there. You're not allowed to have that. <laughs> so, so we're str we're you know over two to start this thing off here, and um, so we're having a little bit of fun here. Yes. So my theory is go big or go home. And so if we're going to fail, let's just go. So on that note, um, I pray that you guys, uh, I pray that the Lord will just let you, excuse me, let you catch a glimpse of a Father's heart tonight. And um, the, uh, I'm young in age. Well, I still think I'm young in age. I crossed the 40 barrier and I didn't think that I'd ever live that long. <laughs> But um, the, uh, there's been a heart in me that was imparted through many spiritual fathers in my life and, um, and to build people. And when we started Northbridge Church um, just under seven years ago, the word that the Lord gave me is, if you build people, I'll build your church. And so that has been our focus, is just loving people, letting God get all over them and mess with them and helping them grow. And so tonight, that is my heart for you, is that this may not be a theological treatise, but this is the Word of the Lord, and it's living and active, and it can change us and grow us to be the people God wants us to be. So I'm going to talk about a word that I know is all of your favorite words. Now, Stephen, real quick, just hit the button on the side. Okay. Endurance. And um, in the church... I can't tell you if I've ever heard a sermon on endurance. And I've heard a lot of sermons. But I can't tell you one that specifically was endurance. And so we all have our idea of what it is. And I'm not here to discuss our idea. I want to talk about how God uses it and how God, more importantly, needs it in us. And so if you would turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to go back a couple chapters to Hebrews 10 in a little bit. But he, the author of Hebrews, which a lot of people speculate as to who it is, um, he encourages us, he, he says, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I think it's just interesting, one version says patience, most of them say endurance, but why did he use that adjective to, descri to describe how we are supposed to run this race? And, um, and it, it's one of these things, or that actually would probably be an adverb because it's talking about running, sorry. I flunked grammar in school, so y'all are going to have to deal with that. Um, but the point being is that he uses this for us and we've got to take notice of this. And so please, uh, let, let's just dig in here. And so I like, I'm a word person, so I like to kind of set the stage with what do words mean and how do they apply to us. So endurance is the power to withstand pain or hardships, the ability or strength to continue. Everyone say continue. continue. Despite fatigue, stress, or other adverse conditions. Amen. In spite of... No matter what the circumstances around you, you continue no matter what. And so, is that a picture of endurance? Training. Okay? To many of us, we automatically think of soldiers going and doing all this stuff and what they have to go through. Um, 
The other day we were at uh, our daughter's swim lessons, and um, that's drama if you ever you know experience that. But um, it's a lot of fun. But we had the there were some Navy ROTC guys training there, and it brought it to a whole new level when he took a 45 pound weight, handed it to the guy, and said, "You got to hold it above your head and tread water." Treading water is hard enough for those of us who don't float. But then you put a 45 pound weight on you. Okay, you just up the ante a little bit here. Okay? And so, you know, this is training. Or endurance, I should say. What is this? Do you see endurance here? Okay? Amen. From Papa Jim. It, it takes commitment in spite of circumstances. To be married and, and to be old and, and wonderful, beautiful couple celebrating 60 years there. That's endurance. And that's a choice. In spite of circumstances, good, bad, every day they've seen. Okay? What about that? Is that endurance? God, I have no hope. I don't even know what to say. All I can do is hit my knees. Every day. God, this is endurance. And I believe that there are some of you here tonight that this is your picture of endurance. <laughs> you might have been there before. You might be there now. Lord, I only got one string left. What do I do? And then you hear a voice from heaven say, Let go. And our response is usually, Is there another God up there? And we're holding on for dear life, and all we see is a thread. So, what is your picture? of endurance. The biblical definition of endurance is this. The word is hupomone, which is a combination of two. Hupo means to come underneath, and meno, which is where the mone comes from, means to remain. So to endure is to come up underneath something and not be moved. To stay strong and to hold it and to bear up under it. In the New Testament, it's characteristic of a man or woman who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. The capacity to bear up under difficult circumstances with hopeful fortitude, not just fortitude, hopeful fortitude that resists weariness and defeat. In my life, I've never seen more of a battle in the church than what we experience today. And I've never seen more weariness than what I look at in the lives of people today. Now God is doing great things worldwide. Please don't misunderstand me. Heaven is open. He's busting loose worldwide. There are more people being one to the Lord ever than in history before today. But the battle is the fiercest I've ever seen it. Especially in the lives of the saints. And to me, why is Satan fighting so hard? Because he knows what his time is. He knows what's at stake. If I can get them, I can stop this thing. But I've got news. Greater is He that's in me than he that's in this world. I can bear up underneath this. So let me ask you, is this a picture of endurance? We don't like to look at this. It makes us uncomfortable when we do. But my favorite part in the Passion of the Christ is when it was flashed back to when Jesus was a baby and fell, or a little boy and fell, and his mom was running to him. And then it showed Jesus falling with the cross, and his mom was running to him again. 
And he stopped her. He put his hand out and he said, No, behold, I make all things new. And he grabbed his cross again and he picked it up because nothing was going to deter him from his goal. That is endurance. Because it's worth it. So when I look at this, I see him hugging that goal. Not just holding on to it because it's forced on him. I see him embracing the cross. Because Lord, if I endure, what glory is going to be shown by the multitudes of millions who will be able to come and have fellowship with us. I'll endure this, God. Not my will, but Your will be done. So two chapters earlier, in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, he writes this. Oh, sorry, this is the rest of Hebrews 12. I jumped a slide here. Who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. Guys, we can't endure just for the sake of enduring. We got to have the joy. We got to know what is the reward. I'm willing to pay a cost if there's a reward. I'm not if there's no reward in it. And I think many of you are like that as well. Who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He finished His race. He endured. And God rewarded Him. So two chapters earlier, the author of Hebrews writes this. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. I want to ask you if you're going through that portion in life that is taking the resolve, is forcing you to endure things right now. What's your promise? But before you get the promise, what's the will of God in that situation that you're supposed to accomplish? Endure is not just standing still and taking a beating. Please understand that. Enduring is going forth in the will of God and not being deterred. There's a difference. One's passive, one's aggressive. And if you're ever going to accomplish anything for God, you're going to have to fight through things. And so please make, don't mistake, is endurance is just sitting here hungry now, God, I'm just going to hold on and take this beating. No, He's not intended that. Walk forward, do His will. And you'll get the prize. He's not going to reward you just for taking a beating. You with me? Amen. So, let's look at a little bit of what Hebrews. How many of you know who the book of Hebrews was written to? Can anybody tell me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, to the early church. Okay, there's not a most most epistles. They specify to the church at this city, to the church at this place. Hebrews just goes right into who Jesus was. And it's a beautiful picture of the sovereignty of Christ over the Jewish system. Religious system, I should say. But the book of Hebrews was written to Christians, formerly Jewish, who were wavering in their faith during the persecution of the early church. How many of you know when it gets hard, our first temptation is to go back? Look at the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. What was their first temptation? Let's go back to Egypt. What did the disciples do? Let's go back to fishing. Our first thing is to always go back when we get in those hard situations. So in Hebrews chapter 6, the author brings up Abraham, the pillar and the father of the Jewish faith. And he says, Abraham's endurance was rewarded, you guys. Look to him as an example. In Hebrews 10, where we just read, he said, We, our endurance, will be rewarded. Hebrews 11, Moses' endurance was rewarded. 
And Hebrews 12 that we just showed, Jesus' endurance was rewarded. I've never seen anyone who has not crossed a finish line get a prize. Nobody. It's only when they finish that they get some sort of reward if they ran the race in order to win it. God doesn't reward those who stop. Those who don't press in. What happened to the children of Israel when they stopped at the border and refused to go in? Did they get rewarded? No. Guys, this is the principles of Scripture. And we need to learn from those who went before us. Because as Hebrews 12 says, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. All these people who went before us are watching now. Come on guys, you can do it. It's going to be worth it. You can do it. So what happens when you finish and you cross the finish line? As I saw this picture, I just had a big smile on my face. <laughs> victory. But for each of us, victory means something different. Victory could mean healing, breakthrough, salvation for a spouse, for a loved one. What about freedom? Provision? Miracles? What about direction? Oh, what did I do? <laughs> that one went really fast. I must add a couple of them combined there. Direction is as much a victory because you're enduring. Lord, I am not going to move until you tell me what to do, Lord. I'm going to continue in that last thing you told me and then you wait for that word to come and you can go in victory. Direction is huge in the life of the believer. Look what he says here in 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Now obtain is the key word here. Because it's not going to be given to you without something else being done. You have to work. You have to run. You have to compete. You have to endure in order to get that prize. So the Apostle Paul says, Therefore I run this way, not with uncertainty. What was that definition we gave at the very beginning of endurance? Deliberate purpose. Certainty. And thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should have become disqualified. He had to go and mention the discipline word. It's all fun and games till you mess with discipline. Disciple, discipline, there's something scriptural in there. Okay? Back um, about 30 pounds ago, I used to run triathlons. And I got bet, and that was enough for me to motivate me to go out and do something crazy like that. But in the process of running triathlons, um, I realized that you need endurance. And it's not just the swimming because I'm a decent swimmer. My body doesn't float real well, but I can propel it enough to get through and not drown. But the bike, man, that was just wonderful. I loved it. Just the power and the speed of the bike. But then they had to make you go run. <laughs> and I'm just kind of one of unless somebody's chasing me or something is chasing me, I'm not going to run. Okay? My short little legs, God did not make for long distance running. And so a lot of the training for triathlon is done when others are sleeping. But your endurance is shown when everybody's watching. 
So let's apply that to our faith. Your endurance comes in the secret place. Your endurance comes when others are sleeping. Your endurance comes from the discipline of daily getting up and running, guarding what you take in, and making sure you're feeding yourself enough to withstand the training that you're going through. It's not just exercise. It's as much diet as it is exercise. Because you got to feed yourself. you got to have your energy source. So the last triathlon I ran, I learned something about diet. And I learned that the day you race, you're not supposed to take protein. Now, I used to take a lot of protein. I used to be in considerably better shape than I am. I was a gym junkie and loved bench pressing and doing all the heavy weights and everything. And uh, then doing these triathlons, it was a, you know, a trial and just running in the mornings and swimming and then doing things in the evening and everything. I was ready for this race and I had my goal, my time. I knew exactly what I wanted. The swim I managed to make through and the time I set the bike, I beat my time. I was on perfect track. And then came the run. And I'm running and all of a sudden this old lady passes me and I see a 65 on her calf and I'm like, a 65 year old woman is out running a 35 man. Something is wrong with this picture. And another one passed me, and another one passed me. I'm like, God, what is going on in my body? And I was struggling, and I got about a quarter mile, half mile away, and I could see where they started the process to the finish line. I don't remember anything. I don't know how I finished the race. I genuinely, to this day, do not remember anything past that point. I remember coming in, and falling down and somebody come and took the timer off my ankle where they did the time Sarah came up to me and she said your face is white and I had grabbed a little thing of Gatorade and started vomiting and this whole thing and I don't remember much of it they took me to the ambulance and you know my heart rate wouldn't even register the guy was like what is going on with you what'd you eat and asking me all these questions and I'm like I don't know. I just had eggs for breakfast. And then after I came to, about 30 minutes later, he was like, what did you have? I said, well, I had a protein drink and some eggs. I already told you. He's like, you did protein before a race? I'm like, yeah, are you not supposed to? No, you're not supposed to do that. It affects your heart and dehydrate. And I just learned about protein. Okay? My training was incomplete. I endured and I finished the line, but my training was incomplete. But now, I know those things. Guys, as we run, there's going to be times we're going to make it by the skin of our teeth. And what we learn from that one, we take to the next race. What we learn from there, we take to the next one. Okay? It is called process. And it's our favorite word to hate. Because we just want the finish line. You know, if I could sit on the couch... If I could sit on the couch and take a pill and lose weight, I'd do that before I'd work out. Amen. But there's a process God wants me to go through that doesn't allow me to do that. So, let's continue on here. I'm just going to ask you some questions to think. What is your level of endurance? Now, I look at a Jim Shatterick and a Ronnie Hester's men who've walked with the Lord for as long as I've been alive, and Miss Helen and others in here, how have they endured? How, how do you even know what your level of endurance is? This is my level in some of my life. Now listen. Listen. Come on. Yeah, can I have that fried <laughs> with some ranch on the side? Okay. But guys, let's be honest. There are some areas in our life where that's us. We all have weak areas. 
Some of us are this. We're <laughs> stubborn, hard-headed, yeah. but there's something that has weathered the storms of life. There's something that has been honed and sheared by the experiences of life that no matter how hard the wind blows, it still stands. This picture is taken from Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs. It's called Balancing Rock. I got a picture of my wife and daughter standing right next to it. Man did not put that rock there. How did it get <laughs> shaved? How did it get sheared and shaped? Through endurance. It has withstood the test of time. There are some lessons in life that are going to come through time and that's it. You can't speed them up. You can't slow them down. You just have to endure. Our level is only revealed by testing. There's no way around it. Some of this might fly in your theology, but Psalm said God tests the hearts of the sons of men. If you don't believe our God tests us, we need to go back to who God is. He tests us. As I mentioned earlier, this is only formed in a secret place. People didn't watch this rock get shaped. It happens when others aren't watching in your private time. The other thing about your level of endurance is it's not natural. It is built with time, with effort, and with purpose. When I was in college, um, I played football, and like I told you, I was a gym junkie. And um, I loved lifting the heavy weights. And my sophomore year, in, um, my freshman year at a game in Iowa, I broke my right collarbone, shattered it, and went through all this stuff I had to go through in the offseason to get back to shape to play for my sophomore year. And I was very driven. I made it through four games my sophomore year before I broke it again. And the doctor was like, we've got to put a plate on it. You just, you can't function like this without restoring your collarbone. And I was like, well, how long am I going to be out? And he said, you're not going to play for a while. And I was like, uh-uh, you're not telling me. You're a doctor. What do you know? <laughs> Arrogant college kid, you know? And so I had surgery over Thanksgiving. I had a little five-day holiday there from classes. Went back, and I was like, Lord, fall, our spring practice starts in March. I got to be ready for that. Okay, I got to get going. So about a week into it, after surgery, I went down and I grabbed two and a half pound weights. Now, my collarbone was missing part because it's where it was compound. It got shattered, it broke. So they put a plate on it, screwed it down, and it was separated. And the doctor told me, don't do anything for at least three months. So let this heal, let this form back together, or else you're going to bend the plate. What do doctors know? Okay? So I go down, I get two and a half pound weights, because I was on a powerlifting team also with our school. And I get two and a half pound weights, and I just start doing the motion. And it's excruciating. And I mean, it's... Press it. I mean, it hurts everywhere. But the more and more I did it, the more endurance and pain tolerance I used. And I got back to where I was ready for football in March. But I started having a problem. My arm started going to sleep, just, just hanging. I'm like, God, what the heck's going on with my arm? Went back to the doctor and he was like, you bent the plate. And he's like, I told you not to do that. No, you didn't. <laughs> but the endurance I was willing to go for because I had a goal of playing again. And so that year as football season started, I was still having a lot of problems with the nerves and the doctor was like, you're never going to play again. If you sever these nerves, you're going to lose use of your arm. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you can either choose to pick up a child one day or you can choose to play football now. 
and it absolutely devastated me. I had no identity other than being a football player. I come from a traditional dysfunctional American family. Okay? You know, I'll share that testimony a different day, but God pulled me out of a big mess called my family and um and he saved me, but I didn't have an identity yet. But he stripped me of everything that I loved to make me what he wanted me to be. Amen. And guys, I will not tell you one moment it was easy. From the pain, the physical pain, the emotional, everything going through at that part, he completely stripped me. But what was the goal? The goal was Him. And he, I knew down deep what He was doing. And I, He, through His grace, allowed me to endure. And the only reason I'm sitting here today is because there was a God that didn't give up on me and gave me the grace to endure. You may, not, you may be getting stripped in your situation that you're in right now, saying, God, what are you doing? There's a bigger picture in mind. And He's going to give you the grace to get through this. But remember, it is not natural. It is built with effort, with time, and with purpose. And you cannot think it's just going to happen. Endurance through daily obedience causes us to experience God's unending supply of grace, power, and love which enables us to live at a level that brings Him glory. It is daily obedience. One thing I love about Ronnie Hester is He'll witness to a tree and get it saved. <laughs> if the Lord told Him to. I know He loves people. Brother, I, I just need to pray for you. I've seen Him do it so many times I can't even count. But it's daily obedience that has allowed Ronnie to be on the mission field, to do the things he's done here, to be the man of God he is over time, is daily obedience. There's no substitute. Nothing else can do it. Because that keeps you in alignment with God and allows His grace and His power and His love to flow through us to bring Him glory. Now, I need to make a point here. We do not have grace to endure the wrong fight. Stephen hit me with that when I met with him Tuesday and I've just been chewing on it. I've squandered much grace trying to fight the wrong fight. Getting distracted. And using effort and toil and work to try to fight this when Lord's like, nah, -uh, I don't want you there. I want you over here. Yes. And then He has to adjust me. And then that grace flow and the alignment come back and then we get the victory. We must keep our eyes fixed on a goal. If somebody has their Bible, read Matthew or Luke 9, 51 for me, please. Or whoever can pull it up on an iPad fastest. Luke 9:51. You got it? Go ahead. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Okay. Does anybody know the context of that verse? When the days came, Jesus set his face like a flint and went to Jerusalem. Does anybody know the context of that? What was that? He was going to be crucified and people were wanting Him to stay and they were wanting Him to minister. And he was not, here's my purpose. He didn't spend the grace doing something that was out of obedience. Outside of His realm of obedience. He knew what He had to do so he had to set his face like a flint, like a rock. Lord, I'm not wavering from that that you've called me to. He endured it, and he went through 
And thank God He endured the cross. A lesson for us. Don't waste the grace on the wrong enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against every power, principality, and the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Guys, we got to know our enemies and know who God told us to fight. What was the song we sang? He trains our hands for battle. Guys, he, there's a fight. We just got to know who it is and what is the right one that's going to, he's going to prepare us for that fight. He's going to give us the endurance for it. So you guys doing okay? Amen. All right. Next one. The kingdom of God is counting on us to finish the race. I want you to understand the weight of that statement. God's kingdom can be hindered or aided by how we finish. Personally, every one of us can affect the kingdom of God by whether or not we finish the race He set out for us to run. Now, how old are you? 14. Okay? This young lady, I don't know your name, I'm just picking on you. Okay? 14, she has a race to run that is congruent with the stage of life that she's in. And that's the same with the rest of us. It's never the full race. It's always stages. If you look at marathoners, they don't ever focus on the full 26 miles. They have goals that are set throughout that process. I catch this one. I hit mile 8, mile 12, mile 16, and it's stages. Guys, we never focus on the full big picture or we're never going to make it. We've got to have the individual victories. But the kingdom of God is so intertwined in our individual victories that what we do or don't do has tremendous effects on it. Good or bad, but they're tremendous effects. So what is at stake if we stop short? For every one of us, it's going to be something different. But let me change one word in this statement. Who is at stake? if we don't finish. Let's make it personal. Who is at stake? My wife and I, um, namely my wife, has had some health issues. And we've had some periods of enduring, mainly her, but as her husband I'm with her in this. And a while back, the Lord gave me a word that I was to get up every morning and war over her as the priest of my home. And that went good for about the first three weeks. Some of it she might not ever have known I was doing, but I was doing it. And then late nights, kids getting up in the middle of the night, things began to derail that consistent warring over her. What's at stake if I don't finish and cross that line? That's not meant as a statement of guilt, but of perspective. From loved ones to people you might not even know. How many of you can tell me the name of the man who led Billy Graham to the Lord? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All he was doing was what God told him to do. But if he didn't finish that line, how many lives would be at stake because Billy Graham never came to the Lord? Guys, it's always about the next generation in the kingdom. It's never just about us. It's always the big picture. Are we going to settle for the pressure or the presence? Stephen hit this last week here at the deck. Are we going to, the goop or the glory? And the time that we're in is this unsettling, vacillating between two things was one of the indictments of Reuben. But it's also an indictment of the church. 
we're being pulled, we want to do this, we want to do that. Sometimes I think we've got enough sin in us to make the God part of us miserable. But we got enough God in us to make the sin part of us miserable. I'm just talking from experience. We can't vacillate. We can't be caught between. There's too much at stake. So what effect does achieving a victory produce in our lives? I want to see if from these two pictures you can pick up where I'm going with this. What do you get when you see the lion and the bear? Can anybody quote that for me? What was that? David. When he faced Goliath and Saul tried to put him in his armor, I faced the lion and I faced the bear and I took him down and I killed him and I know what my God will do for me now. What did that produce in David because of those past victories of enduring? Faith. Confidence. Willing to risk. The miraculous. Nobody in Israel believed David could take Goliath. But when he held up that bloody head, everybody believed. It should produce a confidence in the people of God. Let me tell you what my God did. Just like the children of Israel. O King, let it be known to you our God is able to save. If He doesn't, it's alright King, but let it be known to you. I know He can. Because He's done so much already. There was a boldness to confront the evil King and to take a stand. This is what we have to do. This is what He's called us to. What's your bear? What's your lion? What can you look back in your life and say, God, you did this. God, you did that. God, you did this and now I can face this. We have to be able to see those things and let it stir us up. So, what do we gain if we finish strong and endure? What does crown symbolize? Victory. Victory. Only the winners get the crowns. What else? Royalty. Reward. I would encourage you to go back and read 1 Samuel 17 and look at how many times David asked, what's the reward for the man who does this? There's a passion in his heart. There's nothing wrong with wanting to win. Now, in our house, we're not very competitive. And by we, I mean my wife. She doesn't care if she wins or loses. I, on the other hand, don't know anybody that gets excited about losing. If you can show me someone that likes to lose, I'll change my statement. Okay? We were playing a game of phase 10. If anybody's ever played that card game, you know it. goes 10 phases. We tied on the 10th phase at the end of the game and she would do nothing to decide a winner. I was about to go, but I was like, at least just do a stinking coin toss with me. I don't care. I was trying to come up with ideas. Somebody's got to win. That's the point. If I'm going to put the effort in and endure for two hours, I want to win. Now, come on. Somebody tell me you don't like to win. And I'll pray for you. Jesus likes to win, by the way. He told me himself. Now, can, can you learn in losing? Yes. But you learn a lot more when you win. Amen. <laughs> All right, let's get this thing back on track here. Uh, that's in 
That's in uh, Mike chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created winning. <laughs> All right. James 1, 12. For those who endure, we win a crown of life. Now John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I come to give you life, and that life more abundantly. Guys, the crown's just not for the afterlife. It's for this life here as well. But we win a crown of life. If someone has your Bible, please read Matthew 10, verse 22 for me. Jesus is talking about the end times and He had just sent His disciples out to go minister and He told them they're going to be persecuted. And they're going to be tried. And then He makes this amazing statement in the middle of that discourse. Somebody read that for me. Go ahead. Go ahead. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm, one version says, he who endures to the end. Come on, somebody. Will be saved. Crown of life. Would that be like the ones that are enduring beheading in the Middle East? Who don't forsake the faith. 1 Corinthians 9.25 He says, I don't run for a crown that perishes, but I run for an imperishable crown that doesn't fade away. In this life and the next. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 he was talking about the Thessalonian people and he said, You are my crown of rejoicing. The souls that we see come into the kingdom of God are part of our crown of joy. What was it that Jesus endured the cross for? The what? Joy. joy of the people coming that was set before Him. He endured. This is the crown of will wear because all of us touch somebody. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8 says he's going to give us a crown of righteousness. We've been declared righteous because he made him who knew no sin become sin that we might become his righteousness. It's already done. It's here and now. But it's also fulfilled. It's in this life and the next. And then 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. We're going to get a crown of glory. And last week, as Stephen was talking about the month of Tammuz, is that how it's called? They had a choice. Go up to the glory, interact with God, and receive His words, or find a substitute on the earth we finish this race to the end we will receive the crown of glory let me read 1 Peter 5 4 to you should have had it bookmarked here when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away Guys, God's fingerprints all over you show His glory. You are fearfully, wonderfully made. You are glorious in the sight of God. And as we finish this life and our chief shepherd appears, we're going to receive that crown of glory. It's going to display His splendor. So let me end with this. Going back to Hebrews chapter 10. This is a couple of verses... Oh, snap. Um, I was going to go back, but if you don't... Let's, let's hold on. Okay. Keep talking. I'll fix it. So, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. We started with, you have need 
of endurance. It's perfect. And look what he says a couple verses later. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We can't go back. That's right. We have to go forward. That's right. We have to endure. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We don't draw back. We continue to go forward. William Barclay, who I disagree with a lot of his theology, but he made a powerful statement. He said, Endurance is not just the ability to bear a hard thing, but to turn it into glory. There has to be a goal for endurance. We don't just endure for the sake of enduring. So where do we go from here? During worship and in my prayer time, today I just really felt, I kept hearing that verse, He trains our hands for battle. That there's a lot of people that the Lord is asking to go through a process and we're resisting Him. Lord, it's too hard. I don't want to give this part up yet. I don't want to give this up. And I really, I told Stephen earlier, I thought we are just going to end with a prayer time over people who just need that breath of air of the Holy Spirit, that fresh wind to endure another day. We can't look past tomorrow. We just got enough grace for today. The Hebrews taught that worry is dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's bread. I say it's today's grace. I can only deal with today's stuff with today's grace. And so there's some of you who the Holy Spirit has been tugging on your heart for areas that, Lord, I need to tighten this thing up. Lord, I need endurance in this area. I'm not being strong. Because guys, there's something at stake if we don't endure. And um, ma'am, I don't know your name, but I'm just going to call you out. When you walked in, I've, immediately I felt the Lord say, you only have to carry it if you want to. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know your story. I asked Kim. I said, Kim and I am left field here. And, and Kim said, just tell her when it's time. But the Lord wants to empower you tonight. I don't know if you've ever been filled with this Holy Spirit or if you even know what that is, but that's where the power comes from is that daily relationship. But He is the God who sees. His name is El Roy, the God that sees. He knows what you're going through and you only have to carry it if you want to. He's got it if you're willing to give it to Him. And He will cause you to endure. And Is your name Brooke, you said? Some of you might be in Brooke's boat. That there are situations going on. Lord, do you even see what's really going on? Yes, He sees. And He told Hagar, go back and submit and I'll take care of you. And some of you, it might be an issue of going back and submitting that under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And saying, okay God, I trust that you're going to take care of it. And so Stephen, I just want to invite you up. If there's anybody that needs prayer, don't got a lot of room up here with all these cores, but we can pray for them. And so why don't you come back up here. Thank you, brother. Thank you. You received this word? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Montana in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Mike, Mike and I were talking, or you got to go, okay. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about this from John Eldridge, the author. He said, I can suffer for something, I can't suffer for nothing. So part of what I want to encourage you on is just go, okay, God, what is the something out of this? Because sometimes in the midst of enduring, we lose sight of that, and then we're just trying to endure. And you've got to have back to again the winning and the prize. You've got to, okay, what, what comes out of this? How many of you endured something? Okay, the rest of you in denial, that's okay. That's a separate group. 
How did, how did you feel once you came to the other side? What did you get out of that? Talk to me. Faith. 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 What else? Confidence. Confidence. What else? Strength. Strength. What else? Pride. Pride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a restoration. restoration. Hope. Okay. Hope. Love. Okay. Revelation. 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 Joy. Joy. Okay. Experience, right? The, 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 yeah. the what? Knowledge. Knowledge. Okay. All good things. Okay. And there's also the sense of like, ha. Ah. Ah. Yeah, right? Okay. So I want you now, just close your eyes and think about something you're enduring besides my talking to you right now. Because we want to breathe this fresh word. Okay. I want you to see that slide of Montana I had up here. Because that, that's, that's a picture of refreshment, right? Of freedom, of space. So, Holy Spirit, we just invite you now to breathe life where we've lost hope. So that we have that to cling to. On the other side, across the finish line of that which we're enduring lies this amazing reward and of you saying, good job, well done. Yeah, I knew you could make it. So if you need something, just where you're sitting, put your hands up. You need him to breathe into that. Holy Spirit, hungry hearts here, hungry hearts. Mike, release an anointing for endurance here. Father, I'm reminded of when your spirit came upon Elijah and he outran Ahab. Lord, you girded him up. And I pray, Lord, that you would gird up the people in this room. You would gird up the body of Christ, Lord. And that your anointing, Lord, your physical presence would come upon every believer in this room. Lord, every saint in this room, Father God. And that they would be able to walk in the confidence and the revelation and the knowledge of that if our God is for us, who can be against yes. us? That we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that no weapon formed against us will prosper, Father. Lord, I thank you, Holy Spirit, for just releasing endurance in the body of Christ to stand and proclaim truth, full of grace and love, Lord, as we proclaim that truth, Lord God, to see the captive set free, to see the blind have their sight restored, Father God, to see healings, Lord, and the miraculous take place, Lord. We need endurance, God, because sickness cannot win, Father. Cancer cannot win, Father God. Lord, depression and anxiety can't win, Father God. Lord, help us endure as saints to fight this good fight, Lord, and to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord. Just, just stay in there. Can you, it's, the Spirit is here. I can feel presence on my hands. Do you feel the weight? I can, okay. Just, just, just receive. Don't you don't have to fight for it. This is a gift. <laughs> You're one of his favorites. Come on. He's there on the other side of the line, going, "Come on, come on. You can do it." Fresh water. Remember that rain, like a waterfall. That's what some of you need. Just, just let that come on you. More. More, Lord. Yeah, yeah. More. Shift. More for him. Jim, you got a word that's in the yeah, fire of your belly, so. This, this adds on a little more of a dimension on the word that's been hard to a little bit even more, especially as it pertains to the importance of how we need each other in, in this race and in this battle. Because we are a team. <clears throat> in open Hebrew it says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you, in any of you, an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. 
who us exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We have come to share in Christ if we indeed we hold our original confidence firm. <coughs> mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. Amen. Okay. Yes. So we stir each other up, Father. Yes. Glory. <laughs> Lord, I ask, I, I just want you to keep your eyes closed, but I want you to see yourself breaking the tape at a finish line. Can you get a picture of yourself yes. breaking through the line? You know how they lean to break through the line? Yeah. And the line's really just tape, right? It's not, it's just kind of nothing. But it's, they lean and it snaps. Yes. I just want you to see yourself on that side of it, okay? You have to see the end. So Lord, I ask for that to be locked in. I ask for them to be able to see how you are cheering them on. Yes. 